In a previous video, I mentioned that the Pentium MMX used microoperations, or microops, either explicitly or implicitly via a VLIW control word. I thought it would be interesting to explore this further and see what implications it has on the front end length predecoding. This video is largely speculation due to the internals of the processor not being well disclosed. First, a recap of the Pentium MMX. The Pentium MMX is a two-way superscalar pipeline processor. This means that it has two execution pipelines that both operate in lockstep. As a result, the two pipelines must have hazard checking and resolution, or any hazard or operation imbalance will lead to pipeline bubbles. Furthermore, the two pipelines in the Pentium MMX are asymmetric, meaning that one pipeline is more capable than the other. The two pipelines were named U and V, with characteristics as follows. The U pipeline contains an integer ALU, a shifter, and likely a multiplier. The V pipeline on the other hand is much simpler, containing only an integer ALU. Both pipelines can perform load and store operations. As an aside, I have not been able to confirm if the U pipeline contains an integer multiplier, since no official document explicitly states it. There is also a restriction that the floating point multiply cannot overlap with the integer multiply. This would indicate that the floating point multiplier may be used for integer multiplication. Otherwise, it's possible that multiplication is implemented with the shifter through microcode. And finally, given that x86 uses complex instructions, they must be broken down into simpler micro-operations to execute. An example used in a previous video is that of a memory-to-memory -memory add operation. This instruction would be broken down into three risk-like operations, a load, an ALU operation, and a store. To understand how the Pentium MMX executes the micro-operations, we should compare it to something more standard like the AMD K6. For this comparison, we will consider the dual simple decoders on the K6, which can each emit between one and two micro-ops. These micro-ops are then packed into a set of four micro-ops for that cycle, which is called an op-quad. These micro-ops are then scheduled based on operand availability in an out-of-order execution engine. In comparison, the Pentium MMX can only execute two micro-ops each cycle and cannot rely on a reorder buffer to schedule the micro-operations. This leaves the scheduling up to the decoders. The end result is that the Pentium MMX packs the micro-ops temporally while the K6 packs them spatially. Consider the following example instruction stream containing two memory to register arithmetic operations. The first loads from the address of BX and adds the result to the value in register AX. The second loads from the address of CX and adds the result to the value in register BX. Both operations break down into a load microop, followed by an ALU microop. In the AMD K6, these two x86 instructions can be simultaneously decoded in the short decoder 1 and short decoder 2. Each produces a load and an ALU micro operation, and all four of them can be packed into a single up quad. This means that the K6 will issue all four microops in a single cycle. The best execution time, however, is three cycles. This is because the K6 can only perform one load operation per cycle, while it can perform two ALU operations. The end result is that the two loads are serialized while the arithmetic operations are then executed in parallel. Note, however, that another two ALU microops can be performed during each load, and that a load can be performed during the ALU microops. So in that three-cycle span, the K6 could execute up to nine micro-ops. The Pentium MMX, on the other hand, can only issue two micro-ops per cycle, and thus needs to stretch the execution out over two cycles. In exchange though, the Pentium MMX is able to execute all four micro-ops over the course of two cycles instead of three cycles. But in that time frame, no other micro-ops could be executed. Furthermore, if either load had a cache miss, then the entire pipeline would have to stall, whereas the K6 could potentially fill in that stall time with micro-ops from another instruction. The end result is that the Pentium MMX has a lower latency, but when accounting for the number of micro-operations that can be executed per cycle, the K6 ends up having a higher maximum instructions per cycle. The key point that I want to focus on is that the Pentium MMX packs the micro-operations in time, while the K6 and all later out-of-order execution processors all pack their micro-operations in space. Note that RISC out-of-order execution processors also pack their micro-operations spatially, but their instructions typically translate directly into a single micro-operation, making the distinction less relevant. The two methods for handling micro-operations also have interesting trade-offs in terms of throughput and efficiency.
Here's an example looking at the best case and worst case throughput for the Pentium MMX and the AMD K6. Both assume that there are no hazards, cache misses, etc. We can see that the best IPC that both processors can achieve is two instructions per cycle. However, the K6 can achieve this throughput for more complex instructions, which require two micro operations, whereas the Pentium MMX can only achieve this for simpler instructions, which require one micro operation each. Comparable complexity on the Pentium MMX would result in an IPC of one instruction per cycle. There is a caveat here, which is that the AMD K6 may not be able to execute all four micro ops in a single cycle, especially if there is resource contention. Looking at the worst cases, for the AMD K6, this is when only one simple instruction can decode into a single micro operation that cycle. This would be the case where a simple instruction is followed by one that requires the long or vector path. In such a case, only one micro operation is generated, but the processor will still achieve an IPC of one instruction that cycle. The Pentium MMX, on the other hand, has a worst case scenario with a more complex instruction that generates three micro operations and cannot be paired with the instruction that follows. This results in an IPC of 0.33 instructions per cycle. Here, the two processors traded places where the worst case for the Pentium MMX is a more complex instruction than for the K6. It should be noted that the cases shown here are ignoring vectored operations which use microcode emulation, as those could take many more cycles. Further note that the AMD K6 can only commit micro operations at the opquad granularity, so the worst case scenario shown would mean that only one micro operation was committed in that cycle, instead of the maximum of four. With the framing of micro ops and a comparison to the more common approach taken by the K6, let's look at the implications for the Pentium MMX in terms of the length pre decoding. Before going into examples, there is a bit of extra information required regarding the instruction queue. As a reminder, these are full x86 instruction bytes and not micro operations at this point. One of the documents state that the instruction queue FIFO contains four entries, and it's implied that instructions longer than seven bytes require two slots. It's possible that the queue had a granularity of two entries, effectively making it a double buffer. However, it's more likely that the FIFO had a granularity of one entry. This would prevent any of the queue entries from being in used, allowing for more flexibility when the D1 stage performs parability checking. Also, note that the FIFO operates as a circular ring, which allows for the queue to be simultaneously read and written from the different parts of the pipeline. The first thing to consider when looking at how the back end affects the required length decoder throughput is the limiting cases. We essentially have two limiting cases to consider if we want to maximize throughput. The first is the minimum case in which both U and V pipelines are filled with instructions that translate into three micro operations each. In this case, the total completion for the pair is three cycles, meaning the back end IPC is 0.66, and therefore the time allowed to decode the next pair of instructions is three cycles so a total of 1.5 cycles per instruction. Given that the Pentium MMX can do a length decode for any instruction in a single cycle, meeting that goal is not a problem. The one exception would be multiple prefix bytes, but that's a case we will ignore for now. In contrast, the maximal throughput case is when both U and V pipelines are filled with instructions that translate into a single micro operation each. In this case, the total completion for the pair is one cycle, meaning an IPC of two and therefore the time allowed to decode the next pair of instructions is one cycle. So a total of half a cycle per instruction, which means that accurate pre-decoded lengths would be required for the following instruction pair. A complexity comes from the fact that these decode time limitations apply to the instruction pair that follows these cases. Since the tightest constraint comes from the case of maximum dual throughput, we can consider the possible configurations in relation to the minimum dual throughput. The assumption here is that the case of the three micro-op instructions may be more complicated to perform an accurate length pre-decode. In these examples, the first two cases impose the limitation on length decoding. Given that the first case of single micro-op instructions is likely easy to approximate the length for, that's not a focus of concern. The more concerning case is the middle one, in which two more complex instructions need to have their lengths approximated correctly at a rate of two per cycle. Unfortunately, due to the instruction history dependence here, an analytical analysis is not possible, requiring a statistical analysis based on real-world workloads. Instead of doing that, however, the problem could be approached from the direction of eliminating the parameter space. To begin the elimination, we can consider a few simple restrictions to make the decoding simpler. 
Essentially, we are eliminating any cases that couldn't issue two parallel instructions anyway. First, we can ignore any instructions that require microcode sequencing. Those instructions will take multiple cycles and cannot pair with another instruction regardless. Second, we can ignore non parable instructions in which only that specific instruction can be issued in a given cycle. Third, we can ignore any instructions with a SIB byte since that will result in a more complex length evaluation. This was a condition that more modern CPUs imposed, requiring instructions with a SIB byte to decode in a complex decoder. Fourth, we can ignore any instructions with both an immediate and offset. This was a restriction imposed by the Pentium MMX backend pipeline. Fifth, we can ignore instructions that can only issue in the V pipeline. This is because we only need a correct length in the U decoder to find the V instruction. The correct length of the V instruction can be figured out in the align cycle. In all of the ignored cases, the pipeline will have two or more cycles to decode the lengths of the instruction pair, meaning that an accurate pre-decoded length is not necessary. With those restrictions in mind, this is what the opcode table looks like. There is a color-coded legend at the top, and the numbers in the boxes denote the possible lengths given the previous restrictions. Any boxes without a number are treated as don't care, since they will result in one or more additional cycles regardless. The left table is the 1-byte opcode, and the right table is the 2-byte opcode utilizing the 0f escape byte. Notice that the only instructions in the second page have identical lengths. These are the newly added MMX instructions. As we can see, the opcode table is relatively sparse and regular. There are a few exceptions, which may have resulted in a few holes, rather than dedicated PLA entries. And this is an example of what further regularization would look like. The overwritten instructions in the table are shown with a bright outline, where bright green is don't care instructions overwritten, and bright magenta are dropped instructions. Only three instructions had to be dropped to regularize the table, and those could be added back in using specific PLA entries. This is what that regularized table would look like with the regions of identical values expanded. The first thing to note is that the entire 0f escape page has been replaced with a single value. So if the first instruction byte is 0f, it can be assumed that the instruction is 3 to 7 bytes in length. The next thing to notice are the large blocks of repeating patterns, which make decoding there much simpler. And then everything else is just a set of progressively more special cases. Note that the instructions with a slash in their lengths is variable based on the processor's mode, either 16-bit or 32-bit mode. Instructions with a dash are to specify the possible lengths with memory offset arguments and must have their lengths updated to reflect the memory offset. I couldn't find any information regarding any performance penalty in that case, but it's possible that memory offsets were ignored to further simplify the pre-decoding. If that were the case, then all of the regions with dashes would simplify down to the first number and would not require any pre-decoding of the mod RM byte. Instruction groupings without the dash would always ignore the mod RM byte for length pre-decoding. If that were the case, then the table would essentially reduce down to this. All instructions here ignore the mod RM byte for pre-decoding, and a special case is added for the MMX instructions with a 0F code. Alternatively, this balance could allow for the MMX instructions to exclusively pre-decode the mod RM byte while the others do not. As you can probably see, this table could likely be implemented relatively inexpensively in hardware, and therefore would be reasonable to duplicate 16 times for the prefetch buffer. I will probably do a companion video to this, going over a quick manual analysis of how expensive it would be to map something like this to an FPGA. Anyway, hopefully you found this analysis of the pre-decoding requirements for the Pentium MMX interesting. Thanks for watching.